Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in the Harvard Classics Lectures. We are now at lecture 119. We are in the Harvard Classics volume number 32, Literary and Philosophical Essays, and we turn now to the great Montaigne, the great French essayist, and we're going to look at two of his classic essays on death. Now, just to remind you, the, when we use the term essay, as we like to say often in 303, the word itself in its original meaning was a test or a challenge of a kind. And so um, we're going to be asking, what, what is it that uh, Montaigne will say about the whole notion of death as a test? Now, just to remind um, if you haven't been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net, we, uh, we, uh, I recommend that you, that you follow along there, especially in the Harvard Classics folder. Just to remind, in our uh, 303, uh, Room 303 Learning Theory, we're always looking to connect new information to old information in meaningful ways, and we'll be trying, to, I hope, to do that in this set of comments. Always annotating at three levels, answering three different guiding questions. What does the text say? What does the text mean? How can I relate to the text in some way? When I'm working at level 2A, themes, messages, 2B, rhetoric, not what Montaigne says, but how he says it. Here we're going to be concentrating especially on allusion or references. He's going to make them throughout his essays. It's part of his style, and we'll get to more of that in a bit. Okay. Um, finally, at uh, level 3, we'll ask at 3A, how can I relate this to other information that I know? Here we're going to see in Montaigne, we're going to see the joining or the bringing together of any number of disparate types of strands of thought from Socrates and Plato through Marcus Aurelius and St. Augustine, and of course we'll be talking about the influence of Montaigne's essays into the 20th and now the 21st century. Also, just to remind our Big Five, and so much of what uh, Montaigne has to say in his essays has to do with our Big Five. What does this text say about, one, epistemology, what you can know, two, ontology, who we are, three, psychology, the study of the individual mind, um, uh, four, sociology, groups of people, and then finally the question, and we're going to see it a lot here in these two essays we look at, the question of theodicy, the question of pain, suffering, why must there be death in this world in the first place, and all of that, we'll, we'll get to it. First, um, some real quick biography information. Montaigne, one of the greatest of thinkers. His dates, 1533 to 1592. I mean, look at that date of death, 1592. We're talking eight years from 1600, and of course, we always think of 1600 as the year of Shakespeare's Hamlet. So it kind of gives you a sense. Yes, Shakespeare did read Montaigne. In fact, we'll be reading the translator that Shakespeare read. He's usually qualified as a philosopher, although he himself didn't really think of himself as a philosopher, maybe more of a tinker with ideas, but certainly uh, the greatest thinker of, of the early French Renaissance, popularized the uh, essay form, we should give that uh, kudos to him, of course we talked about this when we talked about Bacon as well, and Bacon's use of the essay, you can see our Harvard Classics lecture number 10, way back at the beginning of our series. In some ways, as we said here, we already have our return back to Plato and Socrates, as well as Aurelius and Augustine, and we're going to see some of that in our study here. Um, both Augustine and Montaigne have some interesting similarities, and I think that in many ways they should be read as companion texts. Of course, we've given lectures on Augustine and his confessions already in, in the Harvard Classics. Um, both of, of these uh, men, Augustine and Montaigne, lost dearly beloved friends to death, and that was a pivotal moment in the way they thought about death and about living, um, and interestingly, Montaigne will lose his, his dear friend, uh, an iconoclast that will have written a famous tract against government, um, but uh, Montaigne will lose him to the plague, and the fact that I'm giving this lecture now at the beginning of 2021, after the year of the germ, as we've uh, unaffectionately re uh, called it in, in room 303 for the last few months, um, it's fascinating to read a text like the two essays that we're going to look at, specifically as it relates to views on dying and death. Right? Now, um, the, everything about Montaigne comes back to his education. It's a fascinating one. He was raised an incredibly wealthy person, and yet his father, who was really kind of ahead of the curve in many ways, is the seeds here, the genesis of Rousseau's views on education in the Emile and elsewhere, um, will give his son at a very young age to a peasant family to live with them because he wanted his son to understand how all different peoples live and, and then ultimately um, to teach as well his boy Latin. By the age of six, he's completely fluent in Latin. He is obviously a polymath. We think of Milton when we think about Montaigne in this regard. So influential as a thinker, um, it, it, the Enlightenment is, is in large measure born of a thinker like Montaigne. 
Um, very influential on Shakespeare all the way to Darwin. And if you look at any kind of list of the influences that Montaigne will have, it, it, the, the, the number of, of people who will, uh, who will say, Montaigne is such a great thinker. We, of course, hold him as uh, sacrosanct in 303, so many of his ideas so, so important, especially his fallibilism. Some have called it his skepticism, his agnosticism, that notion of I think I'm right, but I could be wrong. And it's that I could be wrong part that is such an important part of his work, right? Um, he was, during his lifetime, also a great statesman. So he was a, tr uh, a lawyer, he worked in, in, uh, in writing law, and I think uh, many thinkers have pointed out as well that Montaigne got so much of this idea of seeing all sides of an issue from some of that work. And, and, um, in his late 30s, he retires to his tower. He lived in one tower, his wife lived in another tower, there's a lot of joking about this, and he sat down to begin to read, he created this little library for himself, and to write his famed essays. Now the prose style of these essays, he himself said, borrowing heavily from Seneca and, uh, and Plutarch, we've given lectures on, on these earlier already, um, and he wants his stuff to uh, be almost like a dialogue, we would say, with the reader. It's definitely going to be propedeutic, that is to say didactic, instructional. There are things that he's going to want to challenge you to consider. I hope that these two essays we look at now on death will be like this. Now here again, we find good reason to believe still in the classics. I mean, it's like I've said to you guys so many times in these lectures. If they're classics, they're not classics because me or somebody else tells you they are. They're classics because they speak directly to a moment in time, your time, that somehow can be better understood because of these ideas. And we'll see if Montaigne works here, right? Here again are some of the central teachings as well of this notion of embracing life through death. Um, we can't help but think of Thoreau's uh, Walden in this regards. Um, in many ways, as we've said in 303, we are the stories that we tell and retell. We are the stories that we accept and we're also the stories that we reject. And of course, one of the fundamental stories that we talk about and tell is the story of life and death. So we're going to pay attention to that here, right? Uh, again, the other throwaway line that's no throwaway line is this fact of uh, many people argue there are no absolutes. Really, I don't think you've ever met a 200-year-old person. That is an absolute. It will remain one probably for quite some time, we'll guess. But what does that mean? Well, it means obviously that just like the breath you're taking now as a beginning, it does have an end. And with that in mind, let's turn now to the uh, John Florio translation. Again, this translation that Shakespeare himself knew, and many people believe probably affected some of the lines of his poetry. Um, for example, I'll just give this, it's irreverent, but I'll give it as a classic example. In one of the essays that we're going to look at now, uh, Montaigne asks, well, what's the best way to die? And he quotes uh, some French libertines saying that maybe the best way to die is um, between a maid's legs. Um, and, of course, that's the line that we will hear Hamlet speak to Ophelia. It's a fair thought to lie between maid's legs. And so we get some sense that a play, Hamlet, about death might in fact have a whole lot of Montaigne playing around with it. Now I wish, as I have said in many of these lectures, that I could just read all of this to you, but I, I can't. Uh, but I do want to read enough to give you a sense of kind of where Montaigne's head is here. The first of the two essays we'll look at is entitled, That We Should Not Judge of Our Happiness Until After Our Death. That is to say, the way one lives will prepare one for the way one dies. He says it this way, it seems fortune doth sometimes narrowly watch the last day of our life. They're going to show her power and in one moment to overthrow what for many years together she had been erecting and makes us cry after Labrius, I have lived longer by this one day than I should. So may that good advice of Solon be taken with reason. Again, we're back to referencing here in, the, in his Plutarch. But for so much as he is a philosopher, with whom the favors or disfavors of fortune and good or ill luck have no place and are not regarded by him, and puissances and greatnesses and accidents of quality are well nigh indifferent, I deem it very likely he had a further reach and meant that the same good fortune of our lives, which dependeth upon the tranquility and contentment of a well-born mind and of the resolution and assurance of a well-ordered soul, should never be ascribed unto man until he have been seen play the last act of his comedy, and without doubt, the hardest. Now, this has something to do with uh, Montaigne actually watching his best friend die, and his best friend took a very courageous 
approach and spoke about how courageous he was in his death and in his dying. Obviously, Montaigne knew Plato's Phaedo and the way in which Socrates speaks about his own imminent death and the drinking of the hemlock. The, the fact that Montaigne will qualify life as a comedy will immediately make us think about Shakespeare's contemporary Sir Walter Raleigh. What is our life? A play of passion, our birth, the music of division, our mother's wombs, the tiring houses, the dressing houses, be where we are dressed for this short comedy. Um, we're playing a similar game. A few lines later, Montaigne says it this way, I have seen that cut the twine of some man's life with a progress of wonderful advancement and with so worthy an end, even in the flower of his growth and spring of his youth, that in my opinion, his ambitious and haughty, courageous de designs thought nothing so high as might interrupt them. And then he finishes this essay by saying, who without going to the place where he pretended arrived there more gloriously and worthily than either his desire or hope aimed at? And by his fall for went the power and name, whether by his course he aspired. When I judge of other men's lives, I ever respect how they have behaved themselves in their end. And my chiefest study, as I may say well, demean myself at my last gasp, that is to say, quietly and constantly, we think about uh, the great Jordan Peterson, the argument that he makes, at the moment of death of the people you care the most about, what kind of person do you want to be? I mean, you're the one that's going to fold, can't deal with the loss of the person that you love, and other people therefore can't lean on you? Or are you going to be strong and capable of helping those around you lose the one you love the most? And of course, by extension, when it comes time for your own death, it can either be sudden and therefore you don't have a lot of time to kind of think through the process of dying, or it could be an elongated experience. And what Montaigne will argue is that we should practice preparing for this. We cannot help at 3 a.m. But think of somebody like Emily Dickinson, who loves that notion of preparing to die by practicing for one's death. With that in mind, uh, let's go to the second of the two Montaigne essays, the, the longer one and, and more important one in this regard, the title of which is that to philosophize is to learn how to die. Now, of course, the minute we hear this word learn, we can't help but think of our Thoreau and our study of Walden. We've already uh, commented on that from passage to chapter 2. We must learn to reawaken and keep ourselves awake, not by mechanical aids, but by an infinite expectation of the dawn that does not forsake us in our darkest hour. And then he goes on to say, uh, it, it will sound very much like Montaigne, right? That notion that um, I know of no more encouraging fact than the unquestionable ab ability of a man to elevate his life by a conscious endeavor. That conscious endeavor is pure Montaigne in this essay. He began, Cicero saith that to philosophize is no other thing than for a man to prepare himself to death, which is the reason that study and contemplation doth in some sort withdraw our soul from us and severely employ it from the body, which is a kind of appendage and resemblance of death. Or else it is that all the wisdom and discourse of the world doth in the end resolve upon this point, to teach us not to fear, to die. Now, of course, this is pure Plato, pure Socrates, this notion, you know it's coming, death. Why not prepare so that when the moment arrives, you are ready? So this will be the argument that he will make in this essay. Um, he'll, uh, he'll say a few paragraphs in, um, thou hast already overpassed the ordinary terms of common life. And, and then he goes on to talk about when is the opportune time to die? He points out that both Christ and, and Alexander die at the age of, of 33. And to prove it, remember but thy acquaintances, and tell me how many more of them have died before they came to thy age than have either attained or outgone the same. Yea, and of those that through renown have ennobled their life, if thou but register them, I will lay a wager. I will find more that have died before they came to five and thirty years than after. In other words, during... Montaigne's life to live to be 35, you, you lived to be, that was pretty remarkable. He says, it's consonant with reason and pity to take example of the humanity of Jesus Christ who ended his humane life at 33 years, the greatest man that ever was, being no more than a man, I mean, Alexander the Great, ended his days and died also at that age. In other words, 33, one, one lives to be 33. Montaigne says one should consider that oneself is lucky to live beyond it, right? He says, uh, a few lines later this way. It's folly to think the, th that, that, that way to come unto it. He's talking about death now. They come 
They go, they trot, they dance, but no speech of death. All that is good sport. But if she be once come and on a sudden and openly surprise either them, their wives, their children, their friends, what torments, what outcries, what rage, what despair doth then overwhelm them. In other words, we live our whole lives, T.S. Eliot will say, distracted from distraction by distraction in Bert Norton. He says, we, we live our whole lives, we don't really think about the fact that you ain't met no 200-year-old people. No, no, this thing called your breath is soon, to, is soon to, to, to end. This thing called your life is soon to end. Why not prepare for it? And yet he says most people, when it does finally happen to them, or the ones they love, they're almost like shocked, like they can't believe it. How, how could this have happened? He continues, he says, um, uh, 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 and they despair with overwhelming rage. Saw you ever anything so drooping, so changed, so distracted? A man must look to it and in better times foresee it. And might that brutish carelessness lodge in the mind of a man of understanding, which I find altogether impossible, she sells us her ware at an over dear rate. Where an enemy by means wit to be avoided, I would advise men to borrow the weapons of cowardice. But since it may not be that be you, either a coward or a runaway, an honest or a valiant man, death she overtakes you. Let us learn, he continues, to stand. And combat her. We, I mean, we think of "Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night." Dylan Thomas is. We've given lectures on all these titles at LearnStrong.net. Let us learn to stand and combat her with a resolute mind, and being to take the greatest advantage she hath upon us from her. Let us take a clean, contrary way from the common. Let us remove her strangeness from her. This is pure Emily Dickinson here, right? Let us converse frequent and acquaint ourselves with her. It's talking about death, right? Let us have nothing so much in mind as death. Let us at all times and seasons and in the ugliest manner that may be, yea, with all faces, shapen and represent the same unto our imagination. At the stumbling of a horse, at the fall of a stone, at the least prick of a pin, let us presently ruminate and say with ourselves, what if it were death itself? And thereupon, let us take heart of grace and call our wits together to confront her. A few lines later he says, it is uncertain where death looks for us. Let us expect her everywhere. The premonition of death is a forethinking of liberty. Now this is an interesting idea. Put it in your notes. The idea that when one is forever considering the possibility of one's end, death, there's a certain kind of liberty that will be associated with this because there's no longer fear. Let's hear what he has to say about this. He who hath learned to die hath unlearned to serve. There's no evil in life for him that hath well conceived how the privation of life is no evil. To know how to die doth free us from all subjugation and constraint. It's an interesting idea. In other words, if you no longer fear dying, then you are free to live your life the way you wish. He says a few lines later, I'm ever prepared about that which I may be, nor can death, come when she please, put me in mind of any new thing. A man should ever, as much as in him lieth, be ready booted to take his journey, and above all things, look he have then nothing to do but with himself. Always have your boots on, ready for your death. Now, this will, of course, sound much like Thoreau saying, always be ready to be able to lay your hands on the few items that matter to you in the middle of the night so that you can move on. Very similar. This is where Thoreau will get so many of his ideas about the essential facts of life, as he talks about it in Walden. A few lines later, he says, I'm prepared to dislodge, leave, whensoever he shall please to call me. I am everywhere free. My farewell is soon taken of all my friends, except of myself. No man did ever prepare himself to quit the world more simply and fully or more generally spake of all thoughts of it than I am fully assured I shall do. Now, of course, um, we, we have to think about Whitman and Leaves of Grass in Passage 6 of Song of Myself. We've given, again, lectures on this as well. Uh, to, think, to die is, is luckier, Whitman will say at the conclusion of that passage. Obviously, pure Montagne here as well. Um, he says uh, just a few paragraphs later, he loves to give the example of the Egyptians. After their feastings and carousings, they cause a great image of death to be brought in and showed to the guests and bystanders by one that cries aloud, Drink and be merry, for such shalt thou be when thou art dead. So have I learned this custom or lesson 
to have always death, not only in my imagination, but continually in my mouth. And there is nothing I desire more to be informed of than of the death of men. That is to say, what words, what countenance, what face they show at their death, and in reading of histories, which I so attentively observe. In other words, you know a lot about a person by the way that person confronts the idea of dying, both of oneself and of the ones that one loves. Uh, a few paragraphs later, he says, uh, Let him that can attain to this advantage. Herein consists the true and sovereign liberty that affords us means wherewith to jest and make a scorn of force and injustice and to deride imprisonment, give, um, 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 the, the shackles of, or fetters. In other words, a person who does not fear dying cannot be constrained in any way. He continues, Our religion hath had no surer human foundation than the contempt of life. Discourse of reason doth not only call and summon us unto it, but why should we fear to lose a thing which being lost cannot be moaned? This sounds very much like Marcus Aurelius, right, in, in his meditations. But also since we're threatened by so many kinds of death, there is no more inconvenience to fear them all than to endure one. What matter it is when it cometh, since it's unavoidable? Then he's going to mention Socrates, and then later Aristotle here. Socrates answered one that told him, The thirty tyrants have condemned thee to death, and nature them, said he. What fondness is it to cark and care so much at that instance and passage from all exemption of pain and care? As our birth brought us the birth of all things, so our death the end of all things. It's a classic Montagna line, right? Therefore, is it as great a folly to weep? We shall not live a hundred years. Hence, as to wail, we live not a hundred years ago. Death is the beginning of another life. It's pure, pure Plato, right? Death is the beginning of another life. So wept we, and so much did it cost us to enter into this life, and so did we spoil us of our ancient uh, veil in entering into it. Nothing can be grievous. That is, but once. Is it reason so long to